Hello, my name is Ilya Mellon, or Natalie Lawhead in real life. Thank you for coming to my talk, it means so much to me. You may know me from games like Tetragedon, Everything is Going to Be Okay, or my corporate and small business productivity software such as Electric Love Potato Desktop Assistant. When the organizers of GDC reached out to me and asked if I was interested in giving a talk, I was naturally very excited. I have never given a GDC talk before. This is a pretty big break, even though yes, I understand, this isn't really GDC. Here are my credentials. Quick note, everything in this talk has been thoroughly researched based on years of experience. There is no need to question any of this. Just put your mind on cruise control and enjoy. For my talk, I will be discussing early physics-based aquarium sims and their history. This is not an academic talk. Early aquarium sims have been a large part of computer science since the early 90s, although little is known about their history and the influence they have had on modern gaming. If you were a kid growing up in the 90s, you may have at some point wandered into a computer store and stared in awe at the monitors running such aquarium sims. All the while knowing that you would not be able to run any of them on your computer at home because they were simply too advanced, sophisticated, and ahead of their time. Early aquarium sims were known to be out of the common computer user's league. They were for the bourgeoisie computer users only. The bourgeoisie computer users had access to the technology and the systems necessary to enable aquarium sims. The common computer user did not. After computer wealth was evenly distributed and the common user was granted access to some of the software, most had lost their interest in these simulations. They came to represent the computer elite. Soon after the breakup, a small, albeit unpopular, subculture formed around these aquarium simulations. It was largely viewed as a somewhat elitist secret society of fish software enthusiasts whose supposed focus was on fishing sports simulators. Aquarium simulations eventually disguised themselves as fishing software to distance themselves from the negative reputation of exclusivity. Not much is known about the secret society, other than that you can find former members reviewing early fishing sports software on abandoned wear sites. This subculture eventually dissipated, and some former members surfaced in other communities surrounding sports simulators such as golfing. Fishing software and golfing software may appear radically different on their surface, but the underlying physics are very borrowed from one another. Wind physics and water currents are mathematically similar. Thus the attraction that golf simulators have on former members of the fishing simulation elite. The former developers of fishing simulators are often the same developers behind golf simulators. One can say that the core concepts stay the same, except that fish evolved into balls. It is a complex subculture to navigate. Be sure to enter it at your own risk. The overall inaccessibility and impracticality surrounding early aquarium simulations gave them a type of allure that persisted all the way into the 2000s. Nevertheless, this is also what led to their eventual demise and disappearance from the world of relevant software. As one notable critic once said, the transition from one core mechanic to the other may have turned a fish into a ball, but balls cannot swim and balls are not fish. This alone will forever leave an empty hole waiting to be filled until a truly accessible aquarium simulation is achieved. At any rate, if you were lucky enough to have been born in the 80s so that you could grow up in the 90s rather than being born in the 2000s when people actually stopped being born, without a recollection of the 90s because people stopped being born after the 90s, then you may remember notable fish simulators such as Odell Down Under, Sequel to Odell Lake, it was released in 1995. Odell Down Under is a fish simulator that takes place in the Great Barrier Reef, as made apparent by the name, where the player assumes the role of a fish who must eat smaller fish and avoid being eaten by much larger fish. It was released on three diskettes. Because of the game's focus on eating everything in the Great Barrier Reef, to the point that no other life was possible except for sharks, some critics heralded as an accurate commentary on capitalism and the role the working class must play in order to survive a world that is slowly collapsing into economic chaos. 
Commentary ranged from it being an example of the socialist agenda within video games to why feminism is destroying games through fish simulation. Although this writing eventually faded into obscurity and it is now impossible to find references to any of this, Odell Down Under is more widely known as an aquarium sim and not actual accurate social commentary. As a side note, people no longer being born after the 90s is why so many critics struggle to understand millennials as a concept. There is no logical explanation for their existence. Few people believe in them, although their presence is prevalent. This is a topic for another talk, though. Odell Down Under was supposedly inspired by a much older game, Shark Shark, by Mattel. Shark Shark featured fish as well as a shark and was released on a total of nine diskettes. It was programmed by one of the first female game programmers in the history of video games. L Fish. Released in 1993, it is a fish tank simulator and software toy that was released on five diskettes. L Fish, as the name suggests, features fish. It also featured a pretty great soundtrack. Lifelike fish simulation has been a prevalent presence all through the early days of computers and games. Accurate fish simulation was often featured in sports games, such as fishing sims. Fishing sims and fishing sports games were the functional application of fish simulation. Unfortunately, this was not as friendly towards the fish because it reduced the depiction of fish in video games to a sport where fish were hunted and killed, rather than where fish were depicted as part of a complex ecological system. It's interesting to note, however, that the hunting and killing of fish was widely covered in video games, but not the cooking of said captured fish. It goes without saying that fish came to be viewed as a discardable commodity, the killing of which was more valuable than any other aspect they had to offer. This appears to be the inevitable nature of video games. Video games are, and always have been, a largely consumer medium. It was only a matter of time that fish would end up being commoditized in this manner. Later, the depiction of women would follow suit. Although, thankfully, this eventually came to being challenged. The depiction of women, I mean, not fish. Most notable of these fishing titles were Glug Glug for ZX Spectrum. Released in 1984, Glug Glug featured fish such as crabs, piranhas, and squids. Two of these are actually not fish. It was probably released on just one diskette. Jack Charlton's Match Fishing released 1985 and was a turn-based keyboard action sports game featuring fish and a lake. Jack Charlton's Match Fishing was released on an unknown amount of diskettes as part of the compilation Action Pack 1 by W.H. Smith. Gone Fishing, a video game for the DOS operating system released in 1994 featuring what was considered high-quality accurate fish for the time. Fish ranged from sunfish to walleye. It was also released on an unknown amount of diskettes. But I am not here to discuss any of these. Most of this information has been irrelevant. I'm here to discuss an obscure title that forever changed the face of aquarium simulation and computer physics. Initiating collide fish. Fish collision successful. Collide Fish, 1983 Fish Soft Corp, the world's first fish based physics simulation. Running in Fish Box, 32 fish bits. Collide Fish was first commercially released in 1983 on well over 28 diskettes, but earlier versions of it existed in various government and scientific institutes for decades before it became available to the general public. Collide Fish is a complicated piece of software, the history of which is riddled with conspiracies power plays, cover-ups, and numerous controversies surrounding its depiction of fish collisions. When Fishsoft Corp first announced Collide Fish in their 1970s press release, it was heralded as a revolutionary contribution to simulated physics. As the lead developer, also another first female programmer, commented, Math is pretty great when you do it right. We did it right. The math behind Collide Fish is complex. The contributions that Collidefish had on the world of computing have largely been forgotten, but have in no way been minor. It has been said that the physics used to simulate launching fish at each other laid the groundwork for bullet physics used in modern first-person shooters. Yes, fish physics set the stage for bullet physics in first-person shooters, and some believe that FPSs would not exist if it were not for the mathematical ground covered in aquarium simulation. 
Games like Doom simply would not have existed if it were not for the ambitions of early fish programmers. The physics behind Collide Fish have also been responsible for laying the groundwork for ragdoll physics used in games such as Half-Life 2. It was only after understanding what happens when fish collide with objects that programmers were able to simulate the same reactions that take place with human body collisions. Fish and humans may be very different, but the results of colliding with things are about the same, it turns out. There is a popular misconception that crash test dummies had a play in this, but this is falsified information. You cannot believe everything people say in talks. Collidefish is a complex piece of software with an equally complex history. I will cover some more of this program's historic facts and discuss how these key points eventually led to the simulation's demise and eraser from computer history. Collidefish was the world's first fish-based physics simulation that also featured a realistic simulation of fire. The contributions of Collidefish did not only start and stop with collisions. It was also the world's first fish-based physics simulation that included a realistic simulation of fire. Before Collidefish, scientists did not completely understand fire. Only after studying the post-impact flames of fish did our understanding of fire enjoy critical breakthroughs. These breakthroughs led to the simulated fire that we enjoy in video games today. All of these fire simulations are nowhere near as sophisticated as the ones featured in Collidefish. The fire simulation in Collidefish ran at a total of 80 fish rates per minute, which was unfathomable at the time. Because Collidefish used 32 fish bits, the simulated simulation possibilities seemed endless. Fishsoft Corp. even figured out a way to fluctuate the fish bits according to what was required by the simulation. This feature alone made it a truly extendable piece of software that could cover a wide variety of simulation needs. Fluctuating fish bits were unheard of at the time, and most computer programmers did not believe that Collidefish was actually doing this. They didn't believe that Collidefish's first female programmer could pull something like this off, so this remained a myth for a long time before it was finally proven to be true. Nevertheless, the underlying technical engineering may have been widely disputed, but Collidefish's features and contributions made it hard to completely ignore. Despite apparent controversies as having a first female programmer, Collidefish did very well for a long time. It was hard to ignore. As the first female programmer once commented, make it so good that it's impossible to ignore. At the time, this was highly controversial, but her philosophy worked for a while. It even set the stage for other first female programmers. Such impossible standards survive to this day in computer programming. Collidefish was used by NASA to test sending fish to the moon, rather than shooting fish at the moon and seeing how they collide with it. Throughout documented history, humanity has been fascinated with the stars. Understanding heavenly bodies has been a strong focus of scientific research extending to the dawn of civilization. It was first speculated by the Greeks that if humanity understood the physical impact fish had when they collided with things like the sun and moon, we would unlock the secrets of the universe. It would lead to a universal understanding of science, the likes of which we could not fathom. The key would simply be successfully launching fish into space. But how? How could fish survive the journey? let alone stay intact enough to collide with a heavenly body once the fish reached it. For the longest time, pretty much ranging the extent of the Cold War, NASA tested their theories of sending fish to the moon where a sophisticated space cannon would launch an intact fish at this heavenly body. Theories were complex, too complex for the science of the day. They ranged from cryogenically freezing the fish and launching it to sending an entire aquarium with enough food in it so that the fish could survive the journey. Freezing the fish failed because the fish broke somewhere along the way. Sending the aquarium failed because the aquarium broke, and the zero-gravity environment meant that the fish would eventually float up out of their water. Fish cannot breathe in space, so the fish would eventually freeze and finally break. Either way, freezing the fish consistently happened whether the scientists liked it or not. The fish never made it to the moon or even collided with it. NASA was desperate. How could they launch fish at the moon and monitor how the fish bodies collided with the heavenly bodies? If they failed, then that would mean that science has failed and the world might very well end. Collide fish to the rescue. Using collide fish's advanced simulation capabilities, fluctuating fish bits, and high fish rates, NASA was successfully able to simulate fish collisions with the moon. The solution was simple. Replace one of the two fishes featured in Collide Fish with the moon. They ran the simulation and so much scientific progress was made that day that the Cold War ended.
Fish collision successful. The contributions the scientific breakthrough had on modern gaming should also not go unnoticed. The science behind colliding fish with the moon are what inspired collision detection in video games. Collision detection itself would not have been a concept if it were not for collide fish. Without this, fighting games like Mortal Kombat would not exist. Collide fish was used by the US government and the USSR to test shooting fish at enemy spies. For a long time, the US government experimented with discovering more resource-friendly and cheaper types of ammunition. They desired durable, cheap, and expendable ammunition. The cost per bullet per spy was too high to make war affordable. Fish were at the top of the list at the time, because of how aerodynamic these creatures are by design. They are nature's bullet-shaped birds. As a side note, the US government also experimented with birds, but the birds flew away and this made them unsuitable. Fish were used in controlled experimentation. Some fish were loaded directly into the guns. This did nothing and made the gun unusable. Fish were also strapped to tiny rockets that would propel the fish to the enemy, but the costs of this were too high to be affordable. Some prototypes even did away with the gun entirely and used fish slingshots. This worked for a while and was used in a handful of missions, but the results were not ideal. Collide fish to the rescue. Collide fish had been used by the US government to understand varying collisions for nearly a decade before this use case surfaced. The supposition was simple. Replace one of the two fish with an enemy spy, filling in all the enemy spy criteria and run the simulation. The speed of the fish, the distance of the fish, in time it takes for the fish to reach the spy would answer the long-standing question of whether or not fish make feasible ammunition to shoot at enemy spies. Fish collision successful. The results were immediate and conclusive. Yes, fish could be shot at enemy spies, but the key was the gun, not the fish. Collide fish did not feature instructions for gun building, but they could test colliding a gun with an enemy spy. This was bureaucratically viewed as giving the enemy spy a weapon. Turns out it does not legally matter how fast the gun reaches the spy. There are strong legal distinctions for collisions, unless the thing that collides also explodes or is a bullet. After further testing, exploding guns were too expensive to make. Therefore, this was off the table. Fish being shot at enemy spies was eventually cancelled, but collide fish saved the US government millions by pr providing an accurate simulation of what would happen if it was possible to shoot fish at enemy spies. It would work. The Cold War was won by other means, but fish being shot at people still remains a dream within some branches of the government. Collide fish was never featured in a computer magazine because of the controversial nature of colliding fish for the sake of science. The reason collide fish was excluded from popular computer culture is a complex one, like anything else surrounding the software. Publishers often told Fishsoft Corp that featuring women would hurt the legitimacy of the publication because nobody believes that women can program and it might be viewed as a hoax. Nevertheless, the realism, sophistication, and quality of the simulation made it hard to ignore. The first female programmer of Collide Fish eventually used a male name and fictional male personality so that her achievements would be accepted in the world of computer science. This worked overwhelmingly but may have been too late for Collide Fish since most everyone knew that a woman was responsible. The excuse used, rather than discrimination, was that colliding fish for the sake of science was too controversial. What about the fish? Do they feel anything? Are the fish self-aware? The rest of Collide Fish is so sophisticated it would not have surprised anyone if this also pioneered the beginnings of self-aware AI. When asked about this, Fish Soft Corp failed to comment. Therefore, most critics took the stance that the fish may actually be self-aware, feel pain, and that Collide Fish is too controversial to include in their publication. Fishsoft Corp eventually renounced that a woman was the lead programmer. Instead, they announced that her public male avatar was the creator. This worked for a while. Computer magazines began writing about Collide Fish. Nevertheless, none of this writing exists today because said publications eventually found out that this was a facade to disguise the involvement of a woman and they erased any evidence of ever covering Collide Fish. Collide Fish was erased from history, although various ripoffs that were not created by women and enjoyed much more coverage as a result remain as proof of this software's existence. This behavior extended to other software created by women, so it goes without saying that Collide Fish was not the only casualty here. It was banned in Australia just as a controversy surrounding collisions coupled with realistic physics and marine life. Australia is a difficult continent to ship computer software to. 
The King of Australia had established a set of very rigid rules when it comes to computer games and other computer-related software. One of the biggest rules is that violence against marine life is not tolerated. Australia's economy relies heavily on tourism generated from the Great Barrier Reef. Any depictions of violence against fish is frowned upon. Fishsoft Corp tried to negotiate with the King of Australia many times before finally abandoning an Australian version of Collidefish. As it turns out, without the fish, Collidefish is largely useless. Fishsoft Corp was unwilling to compromise its artistic and scientific vision for its software. Therefore, the Australian market was omitted. Many critics have speculated that if Fishsoft Corp would have been willing to pull off distributing to Australia, we would already be well into colonizing Mars. The scientific achievements made from studying fish have been huge when it comes to understanding space travel. Unfortunately, most of this has been forgotten. Australia was one of the big proponents for internationally banning Collide Fish. Early versions of the software needed a supercomputer to run it. Not because of the physics, but because of the fish. Fish are complicated. Fish are no easy thing to simulate. As I discussed earlier, most aquarium simulation software was exclusive to rich people that could afford systems advanced enough to run it. Amateur aquarium sim developers often speculate that this is because of fluid dynamics, or bubble simulation, or even simulating currents, but all of these assumptions are false. Most of the processing power is dedicated to the fish. Fish are complex creatures. Fish are soft-bodied animals with a very smooth surface. They move as if they do not have bones, yet have a solid inter interior skeletal structure. An entire talk could be dedicated to their physiology and what is involved in properly simulating it, but I will spare you the details. Rest assured that this is no easy feat, let alone easy for a computer to process. As I mentioned, Collide Fish featured fluctuating fish bits. Some believe the maximum was 256 fish bits, but nobody ever pushed the system that hard. Normally, 64 fish bits sufficed. Most of these bits were dedicated to all aspects of the fish's body. Fire only came in second to simulating the actual fish. At this point, I do not need to remind you of the important contributions Collidefish has had in modern video games. Without it, we simply would not enjoy the high fidelity graphics and over-the-top simulations that we do today. While we struggle to properly simulate food in video games, Collidefish was far ahead of its time by having fish fully simulated. It was largely erased from computer history because of a legal loophole Fishsoft Corp found. They fell into the loophole and never returned. RIP Fishsoft Corp. While fighting the Australian government and computer magazine erasure caused by the controversy of having a female developer behind the software, Fishsoft Corp had its hands full, legally speaking. A number of legal battles were being fought, to no avail it seemed. Fishsoft Corp enlisted the help of some of the world's greatest legal representatives. The battle waged on for what seemed to be years. Many employees lost their livelihoods because of it. It was a gruesome and drawn out conflict. Fishsoft Corp was desperate and finally examined a legal loophole, the likes of which no lawyer had ever dared approach. They were warned by some of their top executives to stay away from it. But times were desperate, they could win everything or lose it. On the verge of fully understanding the legal loophole, an amateur accountant got too close and fell in. In an attempt to rescue said accountant, most of the legal department disappeared into the loophole. This in turn caused a chain reaction that took the entire company with it, including the female programmer. Fishsoft Corp was never to be seen again. The loophole still exists, and rumor has it that you can hear the agonized screams of the legal department overwhelmed by the technical complexity of it all. In conclusion, I would like to end this talk on a more positive note. Interesting facts. Before Fishsoft Corp fell into the legal loophole, one of their elder lawyers, an ancient lawyer with many decades of lawyering under her belt, opened a portal to the human world. This portal facilitated a direct connection to any member of Fishsoft Corp trapped inside the legal loophole. Through this portal, most of Fishsoft Corp's top clients were able to continue working with the company and continue licensing Collide Fish. The list of these companies is kept a secret, shrouded in NDAs, but we believe that NASA may still be one of them, although this is pure speculation. The corporation remains trapped for all of eternity in said loophole. They continue to build innovative, groundbreaking research software that nobody can run. Furthermore, because of this portal, parts of the Collide Fish source code were revealed. 
Instructions were to wait for a more civilized era of computer science where female developers might be welcome. Recent leaks of the source code revealed that many game engines were inspired by Collidefish. Collidefish literally set the stage for most of the modern physics engines that we have today. Imagine what a world we would live in if it were not for Collidefish. How primitive would games be? This is important, obscure video game history. If it were not for legal loopholes, we would not have what we have today. If it were not for Collide Fish, video games would look very different. Next time you see an aquarium sim from the early days, just know what went into it. It set the stage for present day. Fish collision successful.